voice of new life starts now. Good morning and welcome to New Life Baptist Church. Anybody else want to go with them? Either that way or that way? I think they have more fun sometimes than we do. At least they're more excited about it sometimes. Um, but again, we thank the Lord for children. Can you believe next Sunday is October 1st already? Time flies by, does it not? Fall decorations, the apple orchards, the pumpkins, they are everywhere. The weather is changing. The leaves on the trees are changing colors as well. The seasons are changing. We're transitioning from summer, where you die from the heat, to fall, where the temperature begins to get cold, and you spend all of your time working up a sweat, raking up leaves, and picking up sticks. And so uh, we praise God for the change in seasons. I trust that you have had a good week. I trust that you're ready to study the Word of God this morning, that it would be a challenge and encouragement to us. If this is the first time you've ever interacted with us, either here in person or online, we welcome you to our church. And and you may be saying, how are you different than any other church? Well, the answer is simple. We care about people. And we make a point to know and share with people what Jesus Christ has done because we feel that it's worth sharing. And we want you to know Christ. And if you're here this morning or perhaps you're watching this online and you don't know Christ... We would move, if it was possible, heaven and earth for you to help you make that decision because we want you to know and experience Jesus Christ as we have, to have a personal relationship with him. If you've never found new life in Christ, today is that day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Why not accept what Christ has done for you today? Once you know Christ, your salvation, though it be the greatest decision you will ever make, it doesn't stop there. The Christian life goes on. The Bible talks about it being a daily thing. It's a progressive thing. It's not that we're working for our salvation. The Bible says we're working out our salvation. We're working it out before each other as well as an unsaved world. Living and exemplifying the life of Jesus Christ. Putting on his attributes with the Holy Spirit's help. Allowing his word to change who we are into what Christ desires for our lives. I would invite you to take your copy of the Word of God this morning and turn to the New Testament book of Matthew, and you're saying, wait a minute, what happened with Elijah? Well, that was last Sunday. We're done with the series on Elijah. If you want to go back and listen to that, you're welcome to. But we're starting a new series of messages this morning as we kind of look forward to soon Thanksgiving and eventually Christmas, something in between those two. And our brand new series of messages this morning is entitled, Who is the Greatest? Facing our pride and putting on humility. And there was kind of an inside joke that happened as I sent off all of this uh, to Ken to put it together for our PowerPoint this morning. There was a, a typo, and the reason why it's funny is because the typo points out, and you're going, where is there a typo? There is no typo. We fixed it. But we laughed together via messages at that because it's exactly what pride is. It's an out type thing. Originally, it said facing out pride, which is exactly what we do. We put on our best face. We face out with all the pride in the world, and we want people to know us that way. Bible contrasts that, though, and Jesus' teaching does, and it talks about putting on humility. This morning, we're going to be in Matthew 18, so you can turn there in your Bible. Matthew chapter 18 is where we're going to start this morning, and we'll be in verses 1 through 4. For our scripture reading. By way of introduction this morning, we think and we look at Matthew 18, and usually the first thing we think of with Matthew 18 is what? Church discipline. Anybody excited? It's going to be a great series, church discipline. You're going, what? No, no, no. We think of Matthew 18 and we think of that being the key passage on church discipline, and I'm not going to go there. We're not even going to deal with that, but The principle of the matter is the same. Whenever we deal with situations with church discipline, humility must always be present with both parties. But we're not going to look at church discipline. We're not even going to talk about it. In fact, we're going to talk about something much more significant. We're going to talk about greatness. What really makes anything great? Do we have anybody who's a Los Angeles Lakers fan here at all? Anybody? Nobody? Okay, that's good. I'm not a big NBA fan, 
at least not anymore. And they, the Los Angeles Lakers, they've had good players. In fact, some have said that they've had great players. Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, for some of you, LeBron James. I'm not a LeBron James fan. But players, good players. But growing up as a kid, I would consider the 90s to be the peak time of the NBA, right? The golden age of the game with the ball that you put in the hoop for those that don't understand basketball. That was, that was the day, and there was one player who just dominated everybody. And it was, whether he was good or whether he felt poorly, he would give it everything he had on the court, and it showed. We call him MJ, or Michael Jordan. The man who dominated, the man who has six rings, and LeBron James can't say that yet, if he ever gets there. But Michael Jordan, six rings, And anybody recall the campaign that was going around back in the NBA days of Michael Jordan? I want to be like Mike. Everybody wanted to be able to play like him, and there was nobody that could play with him. So my question this morning is for you, is that greatness? Some people think it is, maybe to some degree it is, but maybe just a small touch of it. And then there's Michael Phelps, right? Allegedly the best Olympian ever So is he the greatest? Maybe you say this morning, I'm not much into sports. Okay, not long ago, Sony came out with a saying to promote their PlayStation 4, and it was entitled, Greatness Awaits. Don't go play basketball. Just sit behind a console for hours on your couch and become great, right? And you're going, that's not great. That sounds horrible. So what is true greatness? What is true awesomeness? One person has said that everything is awesome or great. When everything is that way, nothing really is. You really want to start a deep discussion in your family get-together? Tell everybody that everything is awesome. That'll get people talking. This is the greatest pumpkin pie ever. So is this one. Well, which one's better? Well, they're both great. If everything's great, then nothing is Special, unique, awesome. I don't know where the word awesomeness comes from. You can ask my wife and she'll tell you I make up words all the time. But awesomeness, this idea of awesomeness or or greatness as we think of it. If you do a poll, who's the greatest musician of all time? Some of you have no idea who it would be. Let me help you this morning. It's a man by the name of Beethoven who wrote just a few pieces of music in his spare time. Maybe it isn't music for you. Maybe it's literature. You ever heard of a man by the name of William Shakespeare? The greatest English literature individual of all time? These are all potential greats, and that list could go on and on and on. Who is the greatest this? Who is the greatest that? Arguments could be built sky high. Everyone wants to know what does it mean to be great. And as you're sitting here this morning, you're saying, I have some modest ideas. I don't really want to be great at all. That's fine if you don't want to be like Michael Jordan or Michael Phelps or sit behind a console all day and play PlayStation or or any of those things. But all of us have ingrained within us this desire for greatness. We all crave greatness in some way, shape, or form. And there's a lot of words and concepts that flow in and out of this idea of greatness. You say, well... I'm not all into the greatness thing. Okay, well, let's take some of these words, for instance. And there's a bunch of issues connected to greatness, right? They're all little offshoots. And when I start naming these, you're going to go, oh, yeah, about that. Here's some synonyms for it. Prominence. Fame. Weightiness. Prestige. Esteem. Recognition. So many more concepts that relate to greatness You think of the word original. You think of the word unique. What do those mean? Other words, for instance, liked. Anybody have Facebook? How many likes did you get on Facebook? Is that an issue of greatness? What about vainglory? What about pride or boasting? And you say this morning, come on, pastor, I just want to be cool. Well, guess what? Cool is associated with greatness. It's all connected. It's all related to that. Now let's look at Matthew 18 this morning. You're in chapter 18. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. If you don't have your Bible this morning, it's up on the PowerPoint for you. 
Beginning in verse 1. At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Our main point today is this issue of greatness. This morning's message is entitled Greatness and Loneliness. Our main focus this morning is this. Like the disciples, we all want greatness. Whether we realize it or not, whether you're sitting here this morning and you say, I'm not, I'm not into that. We all are in some way, shape, or form. We all want greatness, but the reality is the greatness that we want needs to be realigned from a Jesus perspective to pursue it and see it properly. Because a lot of times we're like the disciples when it comes to the issue of greatness. If you're sitting here this morning and you don't know the greatest person that ever lived, let me help you this morning. His name is Jesus Christ. He did what nobody else could do for you. And you have nothing that you can do to earn his favor, his like, his attention. Because the Bible says it's not by works of anything that we do. It's because of who he is and what he did for you. The Bible is very clear. Jesus Christ came into the world. We sang about it this morning. He became sin for you. He went to the cross. He died for you. And he's the only one who is not hanging on a cross today because the Bible says he is alive. And he offers to you the gift of eternal life. And someday when you step into heaven, it's not going to be, what did you do to get here? It's going to be this. He's the only reason that I'm here. And I'm trusting in His accomplished work for me. Because everything that I do in this life won't get me to heaven. But Him. Have you accepted Christ today? The subject of greatness. I want you to consider some questions this morning. What does it mean to be great? Just think about this in your own mind as we get started. What does it mean to be great? Or for something to be great? And... Why do we crave greatness? And then think about personally your own life. How does our view of greatness differ from Jesus' statements and his teaching on greatness? You have some blanks on your outline. We just as the disciples, we crave greatness. You're sitting here this morning and you're going, what? We crave it, and the deeper I go into this message, you're going to see where I'm coming from. We crave it even in the places we don't realize it. We crave it. We're like the disciples. Who's the greatest, right? Is it me? Is it I? Jesus, just say it's me. Maybe I could say it this way. Who's the best at your job? Who's the best in your family? Who's the greatest worker who's the greatest cook who's that and I could keep going we crave greatness and we crave it more than we realize and there's a danger that we're going to see this morning with it but greatness is something that we should pursue before we go any further into the subject of greatness let's stop and ask the Lord to bless our time of study together Father quiet our hearts before you as we look into your word this morning be our teacher Help us to be humble before the text so we can see who you are and see our own hearts. Father, we can see, and it seems so plainly that the disciples were struggling with this. But Father, we are no so quick to see the places in our own lives that we struggle with the issue of greatness. So open our eyes that you might give us great sensitivity this morning and honesty, and humility to receive the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, where you would desire that that take place. Father, hide me behind the cross. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The main point this morning is this. If you leave and somebody asks you, what was your message about from church today? This is what I want you to tell them. What I just had up on the screen. We crave greatness, and we crave it more than we realize. Which one of us is the greatest? We have four kids in our family. 
me, my sister Julie, who you've met, my sister Jacob, who is here, and my younger sister Jenny. Which one of us four kids is the greatest? Well, that depends on if you ask mom or dad. Depends on what you're talking about. Who's the greatest musician? Who's the greatest carpenter? Who's the greatest cook? Who's the greatest this or that? And that could be all over the place. But who is the greatest? And the answer is, it's how you measure the greatness, right? Because we're, I'm not the greatest at sewing. Julie, my sister, is not the best at carpentry. So who's greater, right? It's how you measure it. Who is the greatest? In fact, this discussion, I want you to underline this phrase if you take notes in your Bible. Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Verse 1. That topic of discussion among the disciples we find mentioned over and over, multiple times in the gospel records. And that's significant because it was a point of discussion. You know how when you get together with family, there's always that subject that comes up, right? Politics, the weather, how the Iowa Hawkeyes are better than Iowa State. Whatever it may be, that subject always comes up. This is the subject that came up all the time with the disciples. Who is the greatest? And Jesus has been sharing with the disciples the truth about his coming suffering and his death did not affect them. If somebody tells you they're going to die, guess what? It, it probably is going to affect you. But they're so caught up with, they ignore it. They're so caught up with themselves. They, they miss the whole idea that Jesus said, I'm going to suffer and die. They were only thinking of themselves and what position they would have in his kingdom. In fact, they're so absorbed in the disciples in the matter that they actually argue with each other. You can look this verse up later. Luke 9 and verse 46. There's an argument that ensues over who is the greatest. They're arguing about this. The selfishness and disunity of God's people is a scandal to the Christian faith today. What causes these problems among Christians? Who's the greatest? It's pride. Thinking ourselves to be more than we really are. It's pride. Our sermon series is going to highlight this. Facing our pride and putting on humility. Whether you like to admit it or not, and I hate admitting it, I'm a proud person. Anybody with me? Well, that got really quiet. Our pride. We don't like to admit that we're proud people. In fact, a very dear friend of mine in high school was so led of the Lord that she gave me a book entitled Christian Humility and said, read this. I thought, is it that bad? But you know what? The point got across. We struggle with pride. We think more of ourselves than we really are. I mean, think about it in the world. We are, might not aspire to be Michael Jordan or Phelps. Or, but, but let me ask you, what are you aspiring to? To be? What do you really go after? Ask yourself, why do I dress the way that I dress? Why do I talk the way that I do? Am I trying to gain an audience? Am I trying to become significant to people? Am I trying to be popular? Am I trying to win somebody's approval or acceptance? All of those converge on the subject of greatness. And Jesus illustrates in our text an easily understood way what true greatness looks like. Let's look at the text. I want you to put yourself in the, in the scene with Jesus and the disciples this morning, okay? It says in verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and they're, they've had this discussion going, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And they're all literally waiting, breathlessly, Jesus, tell me, is it I? None of them wanted to admit that they were going to betray Jesus, but they all wanted to know who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. They're all waiting breathlessly, Jesus, just say that it's me. Or you know what? Okay, just say it's all of us. We can handle that. You're all great in my book, right? But you know what? Jesus doesn't do that. Instead of naming one of them, he bypasses them, and it says in verse 2, he calls a little child to him, and he sets the child in the midst of them. 
uh, Jesus, what are you doing? I, we asked which one of us is the greatest. Why are you bringing a kid over here? I mean, tell the kid to go away, right? This is a serious conversation. What, is it, what does it have to do with children? And then he turns to the disciples and he says this, This child, this is the example of true greatness and humility. And the disciples are mouth agape. What? A child? Jesus, tell me this is a joke, right? Tell me this is a joke. This is not greatness. This is just a, just a snot-nosed child. It's not great. Jesus, you don't, you don't understand. Back when I used to run a fishing business, Peter says, I was top-notch. I could bring in fish all the time. And Jesus says, remember that time you couldn't catch anything all night long? Oh yeah, I forgot about it. Well, that, aside from that night, I was pretty great at what I did. And Jesus says, no, that child, that child is great. And then he goes on and he talks about to the disciples, he said, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, much to their demise in verse 4, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest. He takes two concepts in the verses and he blends them together. A human child, as we'll see later on in our message, is the example of humility. And he takes that and he takes the fact that we are children of God and he blends those together. You realize that no matter what age you are before God, here on this earth, you're a child in his eyes. We're all his children. Amen? Which means, as children of God, children ought to get along. Amen? Which means that when it comes to being clothed in humility and putting off pride, we should be really good at this. But we're not. In fact, we act more like adults sometimes in our Christian life than we do like that of a humble child. And our pride gets us in trouble. I want to share with you this morning two perspectives of greatness. Here they are. Number one, the disciples. How do they view greatness? This is a subject that came up to them. They discussed it often. How and what is great? Here they are in Matthew 18. They come to Jesus. They pose a very intriguing question. Verse 1. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, Matthew's account doesn't give us a full picture of what's going on. That's why we have the other Gospels. We compare. We read. Because they're all written from different individuals who under the inspiration of Scripture recorded in their own style of writing exactly what God wanted them to say. It's kind of like being at an event. If you ask one reporter what they say, this reporter may have a different take because they were in a different place and saw something from a different perspective. If you were to go to Mark's account, Mark says that Jesus asked them, Mark says that Jesus asked them, hey, what are you guys arguing about back here? I heard you talking. And we as parents were very good at this, and we, we should be. You put the kids to bed, right? Anybody been there? You put the kids to bed, and this is not a hypothetical situation if you still have children in the home. You begin to hear some chatter in the room where the lights are off. And you hear some giggling going on, and you're like, what is going on in there? And so you go to the door and you peer in, right? And you listen to the conversation and then you cut in with, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, we've been caught. And they, they quit talking. They lay down in their bed. They cover up, right? Caught right in the act. And that's just what Jesus did. What are you guys doing? What are you talking about? Uh, Peter says, nothing, Right? And the funny thing is, Jesus already knows. He knows before he even comes. Luke's version says that Jesus knew because he knew their hearts. And so, I don't know exactly what it was like, but maybe Peter was one of the ones hanging in the back, right? And he's pushing some of the younger disciples up front. Answer Jesus' question. So the question is posed, Okay, Jesus, we want to know who is the greatest. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And you can see maybe some of the disciples, and we learn this later on in Matthew 20, that some of the disciples were thinking, I would never ask a question like that. That's way too forward. 
And maybe that's the way some of us feel today. We look at this and we say, what in the world are they thinking with asking such a question? This is preposterous. This, it's really ridiculous. Did they warrant? Did they have any warrant for asking such a question? We're going to see that in just a moment. But as you think about what's going on here, Matthew doesn't describe at all for us all their question means. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 20. Turn your Bible to Matthew 20 for just a moment, and we're going to look at verses 20 through 28. Because Matthew 18 and Matthew 20 are tied together on the subject of greatness. Matthew 20 and verses 20 through 28, and I know, interestingly enough, another conversation about greatness. I'm not a mathematician, but I do know that 20 comes after 18. Hopefully you do too. They're still dealing with the issue of greatness. And let's pick the reading up in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 20. Then, Jesus, uh, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one in your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. And Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they, they said to him, We are able. And he said to them, You will indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. And Jesus called to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be a servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. After that, Jesus said, and I, I can just I can picture the disciples, right? They're hitting each other on the shoulders, going, What are you thinking talking to Jesus like this? Maybe some of those who had indignation were mad because they didn't get an answer or ask the question of Jesus first. And we need to understand the mother's mindset here. She wants the best for her sons. There's nothing wrong with asking the best of God for something. There's nothing wrong with that. To be in positions of prominence. Who wouldn't want that, right? One on your left, the other on your right. Can you make that happen? Jesus is essentially what she says. In the language of the text, it's literally make it so or command this to be. Make sure that this takes place, Jesus. But what is actually going on here with the disciples is a misunderstanding of greatness. How do they actually perceive it? Notice what they missed. She asked the question, I have, I have something for you. Jesus exposes what they're actually getting at, and the issue wasn't being close to Jesus. You realize today that the greatest thing that you and I can do is to be as close to Jesus as we possibly can. You know, today it's amazing. Nobody, when you go to their house, has posters of Jesus on the wall. I want to be like him, right? You walk into any teenage young person's room, they have a poster of whoever they admire. A sports figure, a singer, an actor. I want to be like them. I want to be great like them. Why does nobody today want to be great like Jesus? Nobody's striving for that kind of greatness. And you see in this text, the issue is being a ruler, being a great one with position and authority. The reason why it is that we struggle with this subject, and verse 25 highlights this in Matthew chapter 20. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over and their great ones exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. What they're craving is position and power and prestige. It's greatness. They wanted to be great. They wanted to have a status of sitting next to Jesus and the authority to enact on his behalf. That's what they were really clamoring for. Notice what Jesus says to Peter in Matthew 19 and verse 27 very quickly. Look at verse 27. Whoever desires to be first among you. I'm sorry, back up to, to verse 27 of chapter 19. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? 
It's a great question for following and being a disciple of Jesus. Is it ever easy being a follower of Jesus? And the answer is, it's not. It costs you nothing less than your life. That's what the twelve had learned. They'd been following Jesus for several years. Others had fallen away, but they had not fallen away from Jesus. And they're essentially saying, so what's, what's in it for us? It's a legitimate question. And so Jesus answers that in verses 28 and down through verse 30 of chapter 19. And he ends with this, but many who are first will be last and the last first. The disciples have some measure to say, Jesus is, this is a legitimate question to ask you. Who is the greatest? Doesn't it also mean position and power, right? It's kind of like today when you get a promotion at your job, right? You would hope that it comes with some better position, power, pay. It's amazing how that's all alliterated. But there's something that's attached to a greaterness, a greatness. But they missed what Jesus said next. Many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Because to the disciples, all they're fixated upon is position and power. It's all being significant. And isn't that what we really crave? We want significance. We want to be a somebody, and that might mean even in your little dinky world, you say, I I don't necessarily want to be a somebody to 9 billion people around the globe. I don't necessarily want everybody reading about me tomorrow on the news. But... But I want to be a somebody in my family. I want to be a somebody in my church. I want to be a somebody in my neighborhood, to my friends, to my neighbors, to my coworkers, those who know me. I want to, I want to be a somebody. I want to stand out. I, I want to be significant. It's an issue of greatness. I want people to drive by and look at my yard and go, wow, aren't they something? Or their house. Their perspective was all on position and all on power. Significance in the eyes of man in comparison with other men is what they understood greatness to be. And before we get into Jesus' reply, ask yourself this, where in my life do I crave greatness? Where in your life right now do you crave greatness? And I'm not talking about what we're going to look at here in a minute. Jesus' thoughts on greatness. I'm talking about The inward, proud, selfish greatness. Where in your life do you crave to be significant? I kind of joked a little bit earlier by the way that we dress that it shows that we want to be somebody. How often do we buy clothes for our kids or for us that just ooze, I want to be significant, right? They do this with kids' clothes. I remember when Rachel was young enough to still wear a onesie. That feels like that was a long time ago now. Okay, but I remember getting her a onesie and it said this, world's cutest princess, right? She has no clue about that. You put it on her, you know, she don't know what it says. She can't read, she can't talk. And isn't, isn't she the world's greatest princess? And you're going, no. She's a sinner, right? She spits up. She poops. Okay? She's not the world's greatest princess. But we do this. Be careful about how you think about this issue of greatness. It actually seeps into every area of our lives whether we want to admit it or not. The disciples were fighting over the same thing that you and I argue over today. I'm a male. I'm a man. Men tend to be competitive. All the men should say amen, hopefully. doesn't matter what it is. If we are involved in it, it's a competition. If it's picking up chairs after church, who can carry the most, right? I thought that kind of ended after high school. But it's a competition. And competition is connected to greatness. Ponder with me for a moment what's going on in your heart. Think about it. Maybe you say, well, I just like winning. But there's something deeper going on. I suspect because I know my own heart and I know something deeper is going on. Greatness. What did Jesus say about greatness? Perspective number two. And I said in your outline, it says, what 
or how did he view greatness? I would even say it this way. How does he currently view greatness? Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? How did he and how does he? What's Jesus' perspective? We talked about the disciples briefly. Let's look at Jesus' perspective in verses 2 and down through verse 5. Very, very different perspective on greatness. And I want to give you these four points about true greatness. Number one, greatness is valid and it's a worthwhile pursuit. You and I should strive for greatness. It's not wrong to be great, but it's great in the eyes of God, not great in the eyes of man. And the perspective that we have on greatness matters greatly. That sounds really emphatic. The perspective that we have on greatness, it matters greatly. We need Jesus' perspective. We would envision Jesus and maybe what he is thinking as the disciples bring this question up. Jesus would sit and say simply, sit down, son, when asked who is the greatest, right? But he didn't respond like that. Greatness is a valid thing. It's a worthwhile pursuit. The problem is how we define it. How we define greatness. Greatness is how many championship rings you can put on your hand when you measure it, right? Right? If that's greatness, then let's ask ourselves this morning. Have any of you ever won the NBA Finals, the Super Bowl, a NASCAR championship? Anybody have a green jacket from the PGA Tour? No? Okay, then very simply, according to the world's definition of greatness, we're all losers. We're not great. (laughs) We're pathetic. Okay? And I'm glad that when God looks at me, he doesn't see me on the world's perspective of greatness. Jesus redefines what it is. And that's why when we look at his response, it's amazing. He doesn't say greatness is a thing. We think about that. Greatness is a thing. Greatness is this. Greatness is this. Jesus says it's not a thing. We're looking at it the wrong way. That's not how he wants them to think. Look at what it is, verses 2 and 3. We already read this. But he calls a child, and the child comes. You want to know what greatness is? Jesus says, greatness is a child. Jesus said children are great. Now that depends, parents, on the day, right? (laughs) Some days are great. Some days you're not sure who they belong to. Now if we're not careful to think through Jesus means by this and what he's trying to say, we can come to all kinds of wacky conclusions. Very wacky ones. Jesus is not saying, when he says this, that children are great, that children are sinless. So don't misunderstand me. Children are sinners. I can attest that. I have five kids. Children are sinners. They act like their parents. He's not saying that children are innocent to such a degree that you can never correct them either. What he is talking about is the status of a child. Their inherent position in life, they have it by default. And you've got to go back to the time period of when this is taking place to understand this. In the Greco-Roman times, the society chain seen by a man was this. There's ruler... There's male, there's adult, and at the very bottom of that list, you have child or slave. That's why Jesus makes a reference here to a child and later on in Matthew 20 as a slave. They were at the bottom of society. Nobody wanted to be seen as a child. Nobody wanted to be a slave. Think about today's society for just a moment. The world doesn't see children as important. If they did, we wouldn't be killing them. If you think about serving other people, service is the last thing on most people's minds. But you know what everybody wants to be? They want to be the disciples. Who's the greatest? They want to be in a position of prominence and power. The ideal pinnacle of the time was an adult male. The child was the very bottom of the list. They cared for kids, but they also understood that kids were very much dependent upon other people. They were vulnerable. They could be tricked, manipulated easily. They understood that kids were needy. They were insignificant and couldn't contribute anything to society. That's why they looked at the adult male as the pinnacle of a human being because he could contribute fully to his society. In fact, back in the infant mortality rate of those days, it was incredible. 
They would not even name their kids until eight days after they were born because they could die so quickly and easily in those first few days following birth. In fact, in those first eight days, if the child died nameless, they would simply bury the child under their house. And that was it. Typical, that was their view of childhood. They understood that there was potential, but it was only a potential. In the eyes and the minds of the disciples, Jesus brings the object lesson to bear in the midst of them. And as the child comes right up to them, Jesus says, as he picks the child up, and I can almost envision this, he sets the child in his lap and he says, this is great. And if you're a grandpa or a grandma, you're like, yeah, I know. (laughs) It's great. He sits him down and he says, this, this is great. And the eyes of the disciples look at Jesus like, what is he talking about? This is great. Are you serious? This is some snot-nosed kid, and this is great. The point is not that they are great because they are sinless, but they are great because of their status in life. They are as low as low can be in all of human society, and that's what Jesus is highlighting. It's even what we see here. He speaks in verses 3 and 4. He takes and he says this, In order to get into the kingdom of God, he says, you must be converted and become as little children. Whether you realize this or not, when you accepted the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you had to become as a child. You had to humble yourself and admit, I'm not the ruler, I'm the child, I'm the slave, and the master is the only one who can give me access into heaven, and his name is Jesus Christ. In the eyes of God, children are high. In the eyes of the world, we don't see them from even the perspective that Jesus did. A second thought about greatness. Greatness is valid and it can be a worthwhile pursuit. But greatness can be pursued and can be achieved. You and I, we don't like humility. We don't like humility. We might say it is the chief of all virtues and we actually might believe this, but no one actually wants to be humble because it grinds against our pride. It grinds against our ego. To be humble means that I have to do this. To be humble means I have to do that. What's the most humble task in your house? I mean, the the task that nobody wants to do, right? For some of you, it's dishes, right? For some of you, it's bathrooms and cleaning them. For some of you, it's going out in the yard and picking up after the dog. That is the lowest of the lowest of the low. Yeah, humility is a great thing. Uh, Somebody else do that, right? But Jesus says in verse 4 that you have to humble. Look at verse 4. It says this, Therefore, whoever humbles himself... There's a lot about humility that we miss from this verse. We should willingly humble ourselves because you don't want God to humble you. Be willing to be humble because God will. God will humble you. It's not a jersey or trophies or medals or recognition, but humble yourself. It means you lower yourself. It means you see yourself low in status. You see yourself down at the bottom. And I think it's, it's helpful to differentiate because Jesus is talking about a child, the difference between childishness and childlikeness. Childishness is saying, okay, let's go play with some toys and have fun and speak to each other and goo-goo and gaga like all the other children. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about childlikeness. It's having the same societal status as a child. That's what Jesus is talking about. Unless you humble yourself and you become like a child, But a lot of believers don't even want to do that. A third thought. Greatness is not only important, but it's necessary. Look at verse 3. You will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven unless... The disciples want a quick answer. They want an answer. Who's the greatest? Just give us some names. Is it, is it John? Is it Peter? Is it James? Is it somebody else? You know, Maybe it's all of us. Just, just let us know. Everybody wins. But he goes further then even what they want, and he says, humility, true greatness, becoming like a child is not just a good virtue. It's necessary in order to get into heaven. 
And it radicalizes their entire idea of greatness. See, if you think greatness is not really my MO and I'm not really going for that, then actually you've missed the eternal lifeboat. If you think about it the correct way, when Jesus says some things, it's almost, and it grinds against our internal impulses. When he says, unless you turn and become like a child, you won't even enter the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that in order to be saved, you must first be humble. There's a lot of people that are going to go to hell full of pride. Because they don't need anybody to do anything for them. And maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? I don't need Jesus Christ. Can I tell you? Someday you're going to regret that. Now is the time to humble yourself. If you are never humble, you can never be saved, is what Jesus is essentially saying. We're talking about greatness in the kingdom of God. If you never lower yourself and you miss what the Gospels have to say about who you truly are before God, you're going to miss it. As a believer, never, ever forget who you were at the base of a blood-stained cross. You had to humbly acknowledge the one on that cross died for me because I in my own pride would never do that. And because of the fact that the one hanging there in his humility on my behalf did that, I can enter heaven. There's a fourth thought on greatness, though. And that is this. Greatness is not only theoretical, but it's practical. Look at verses 4 and 5. Whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. It's one thing to ask yourself, am I a humble person? And if you answer yes to that question, that probably means you're not a humble person. But as you think about it, it's a good question to ask. How do I know if I'm a humble person? How do I know if I'm humble? Humility is not something theoretical. It's not something that floats in the sky. Humility is on the ground. I work for the phone office. And I can tell you that the phone office has changed my definition of what it means to be humble. Going into houses, I have learned there's a big difference between my house and other people's houses. Some houses are really, really clean. Praise the Lord. There's other houses I feel like I need a complete shower when I'm done. Humility is walking in there and treating that customer as though they're a millionaire. And and helping them. And, And the reality is, it's walking into the house when everything in your being says, get back in the truck and go somewhere else. But it's humility. It's practical. You have to humbly serve somebody else. And when we looked at Matthew 20, that's exactly what Jesus says. He says, whoever humbles himself and serves, humility is it's serving others. Notice what he says in verse 5. It's receiving one little child like this. What does that mean? He brings a child in the group and he says, this child, this lowest in society, he's the greatest. What is becoming like a child look like in life? Humble like a child. He says that if you practically receive the word, is welcome in. Welcome in children like this. It's humility in action. Now think about this in context of church and your own life and service and humility. How many people really want to work with kids? Let's be honest. How many people really want to work with kids? It's amazing to me today that we don't have people lining up at the door to work with kids. Kids are amazing, right? They have their days. You had your days when you were a kid. But kids, Jesus is stressing the idea that humility recognizes that you are low. You don't understand humility until you've worked with kids. Kids will teach you about humility. They will do the unthinkable. And then some. 
No problem recognizing and welcoming those who are low. Do you remember what Jesus said in the midst of the other disciples discussing something? He said, don't send the children away. He said, let the little children come to me. Why? Because those children in my eyes are worth it. Humility serves. Would a ruler in this time have stooped down and welcomed the child as if there were royalty? If a kid came up to your favorite actor, your favorite sports player, would that sports player pick them up and act like they were the greatest thing in the world or would they continue to talk to the reporter about how great they were? Humility serves the lowly without a pat on the back. Humility serves the lowly without getting any sort of praise. Humility in children's ministry is not like this. As one person said to a friend, Hey, did you see that I helped in nursery last week? It was the first time I've done that in like a year. Yeah, that's, that's not humility. Humility is being low. And as we think about what Jesus is getting here, we need to wrap this up. His concept and definition of greatness is different from the disciples. According to Jesus, greatness is not how high you reach, but it's how low you stoop. That is true greatness. What Jesus values most is not how high you reach in life, but how low are you willing to stoop to serve others. Maybe you need to think through your own life and you need to think through humility and, and think about greatness and identify in your life, this is where greatness is a struggle for me. But then let me ask you, where are the areas where you won't be humble? You won't do this, you won't do that. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, what did he do? Jesus was great, right? Let's just get that out of the way. Jesus was great. All God's people should say amen to that. Jesus was, is, and always will be great. I'm a nobody. But on the night in which Jesus was going to be betrayed and eventually go to the cross, that night he was not so full of pride that he wasn't willing to serve because the Bible records very clearly he picked up the towel and he washed the disciples' feet. That was the lowest servant job of anyone in the entire house. And Jesus did it. And he said, you do this likewise. And I hate to say this, but many of us today, we would stare at the towel and we'd look to the person next to us and say, you do it. Because our own pride gets in the way of serving God. Our lives ought to be characterized by humility. But we have to face our pride. So let's do that as we close. Where do you have little cravings for greatness in your life? Where, where is pride an issue in your life? Maybe I could ask it this way this morning. Is your idea and concept of greatness matching what Jesus says is true greatness? Greatness is a child. So my idea of, of greatness, pastor, is wrong. Well, if it's not characterized by humility and a lowly mindset and the example of our Savior, then probably not. But then I would ask this, because it, it's not just identifying where we're wrong. What I ask you is this, where are you going after greatness in your life? Where are you, where are you putting greatness to work? And I'm not talking about the world's greatness. I'm talking about the humility, biblical greatness. May God help us to understand what Jesus taught his disciples regarding true greatness. And I, if I can say it this way as we close this morning, go after biblical greatness. All of us want to get to heaven someday and hear, well, well done thou good and faithful servant, right? We want to be great when we walk into heaven. But you know what, what makes us great in heaven is not who we are, it's who he is and what we do for him. Greatness. Let's close our time in prayer. Father, we're thankful for your word. Father, thank you for the message that you've laid upon my heart. Father, I don't know about any other person that's here today but me. And Father, I know even in 
the deepest recesses of who I am, pride is a major issue. And if we asked, I'm sure there's others that would say the same thing. We crave greatness. We strive for greatness. And so oftentimes our greatness that we desire is not humility. It's not greatness in the eyes of God. It's, it's greatness in the eyes of the world. We want the power. We want the prestige. We want the paycheck that comes with greatness. But as Jesus has reminded us again this morning, the answer to who is the greatest is seen through the object lesson of a child. It's a lowness. It's, it's a position of lowness in society. That we don't see ourselves higher than we should. We have Jesus' kind of approach to greatness. And Father, I don't know each and every heart that's here. I don't know. There might be someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ, their personal Lord and Savior. And today, they need to meet the greatest person ever, Jesus Christ. They need to accept the fact that he died on the cross for them because of the fact that they are not great. They're a totally depraved, wicked sinner that Jesus Christ had to go to the cross to redeem. And it was because of his shed blood on the cross through his resurrection from the dead that they have the privilege to be great in God's eyes. Not because of who they are, but because of what Christ has done for them. Might do they be the day of the salvation for that individual. Father, for each and every one of us that know Christ as our personal Savior, might we look in our lives, might we dig deep and identify these areas in our life where we crave greatness. Might we evaluate our lives through the lens of Scripture and see if the areas, the things that we're going after and pursuing are really great in God's eyes? And might we make pursuing biblical greatness, humility, being clothed with that the desire of our lives. Father, thank you for the privilege we've had to study your word. Dismiss us today with this blessing. And might you bring us back again to study your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. If it was a blessing, would you consider liking it and subscribing to our channel? And don't forget to hit that bell icon. Thanks for watching.